good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to present our work, uh, Getting There and Beyond, uh, Incidental Learning of Spatial Knowledge with Turn-by-Turn -turn Directions and Location Updates in Navigation Interfaces. Yeah, it's a long title. <laughs> So this work was jointly done with my advisors, Professor White at Fu and uh, Professor Gary Karahalios. So. So uh, navigation is always considered as a hard task. So in, in the past, people used to use paper maps to navigate from one location to other. Now, uh, when GPS satellites uh, first became official, it actually opened up a new direction for navigation tasks. Uh, people started creating smart applications so that uh, when users are uh, navigating in the real world, they can get uh, real-time help and uh, to go uh, or to drive or to walk to their destinations. <coughs> now, uh, over the years, um, people actually started building navigation applications for indoor environments as well. Uh, although GPS signals are not accessible uh, for, from indoor environments, people, uh, researchers started replacing the GPS uh, satellites with Wi-Fi or RFID-based beacons so that people can use the navigation applications the same way that they do for outdoor environments. Now, at a first glance, you may think like the purpose of the indoor and outdoor navigation applications are more or less same from the user's perspective. But if you look closely, they will, there are some subtle differences between these two types of uh, applications. For the outdoor applications, the main purpose of the outdoor applications is to help people navigate from one location to the other, uh, following either the shortest or the fastest route possible. But for indoor navigations, reaching to the destination is only part of the story. So in many of the occasions, uh, it also involves uh, experiencing the environment as well as exploring the locations to the fullest. So let's take some examples where indoor navigation applications are most useful. For example, large shopping malls, um, international airport terminals, uh, large administrative buildings, uh, hospital buildings, libraries, museums, and so on. So in many of these spaces, uh, people actually get lost because of the homogeneous architectural structure of these buildings and because of very few landmark locations for future reference. So people do need navigation applications in these places so that they don't get lost. Now, uh, one of the main challenge of using navigation apps in these locations is that uh, many of these locations are very crowded areas. So it is really hard for people to carry a navigation app uh, in these places. And even if they do that, uh, because of the closed architecture and uh, some uh, multipath errors, sometimes Wi-Fi or RFID signals are not very accurate in these locations. So at this point, you may be thinking like, OK, people will eventually learn how to navigate in these places. It's, a, such a, it's only a temporary problem. But in fact, it is not a temporary problem because researchers have found that uh, people generally do not learn about their environment automatically. So uh, they worked on the, uh, act, um, the workers who work in, the, um, in a building regularly, and they found that they often get lost even when they are actually going to the same building every day. So, one solution that we often see in shopping malls or museums is that uh, something like that you are here map, which is a static map placed in different locations of that environment. But uh, although this sounds a promising uh, solution, the problem with this type of map is it is really hard to find these maps in a large environment like a shopping mall. And when, even when you find one like this, it is really hard to get oriented with these maps because they are static and uh, they cannot, people cannot move these maps based on their own orientation. So uh, in our work, uh, our main purpose is to 
design some indoor navigation applications so that that can by default help people to navigate in an environment, but at the same time, uh, that will help people to learn about their environment incidentally, so that over the time, people will feel more confident uh, to navigate in these places on their own. And we hypothesized that all the design elements of the indoor navigation applications are not equally effective in terms of helping people learn about their environment. So we asked the following research question that how the interface design elements of indoor navigation applications can help people learn about their environment. Or more specifically, we want to ask how the design elements can help people learn the spatial knowledge about the environment. Now, let me explain uh, quickly what do we mean by spatial knowledge in our context. So spatial knowledge explains how people encode, process, or utilize spatial information in different situations. There are mainly two types of spatial knowledge, survey knowledge and route knowledge. So survey knowledge actually explains the topographic properties of the environment, where they uh, define the location of an object based on the coordinate system or the Euclidean distance between uh, two objects. On the other hand, for the route knowledge, it is actually recorded as a sequential record, and uh, it depends on the movement. So basically, people learn route knowledge when they do navigation activities on their daily life. So I, we revised our research question, and we want to ask whether how the de interface design elements actually help people learn the survey and route knowledge about the environment. Now, to answer these questions, we actually looked at what are the existing interface design elements available in off-the-shelf navigation applications. So we mainly found two main types of um, inter design elements that uh, we found in our existing apps. The first one is the frame of references. Uh, frame of reference is actually basically the background uh, information that you see in navigation apps uh, to represent the environment. So in this example here, uh, the app has used the floor plan or the map of the location as frame of reference. And the next one is the navigation queue. So navigation queue helps people to give hints how uh, they can uh, reach to their destination. So in this example, it's actually the, yeah. So it's like the arrow is working as a navigation queue. Uh, so uh, we finally revised our question in a way that uh, how the frame of references and navigation cues are helping, uh, can help people learn about survey and route knowledge about the environment. So this is the final version of our research question. I promise I'm not going to expand <laughs> it anymore. <laughs> so let's see what are the different types of frame of references available in navigation apps. Uh, we mainly found two major types of frame of references. The first one is the floor plan or the um, map of the environment. We call it the map interface. And the next one is the live video feed of the environment uh, captured through the device camera. So we call it the video interface. Now let's see what are the navigation cues that are commonly used in navigation apps. The first type are the directional arrows which directly tells people when and where to turn to reach to their destinations. And the second types are the relative location updates. Uh, these cues tell people uh, what is their current location so that they can decide uh, how they can reach their destination with respect to the frame of reference. Now the look of these uh, update, location updates can vary based on what types of frame of references you are using. For example, for the map interface, we found that uh, location pin is commonly used to uh, locate the current location of the user uh, with respect to the destination and the frame of reference. Uh, on the other hand, for the video interfaces, we found that um, there is a, a navigation queue called the navigation circle, which actually works um, similarly, uh, similar to radar, which uh, tells people that based on their current location, in which direction they will find their destination. So that user can figure out like how they can reach their destinations by themselves. So the main difference between these two types of navigation cues uh, is um, the 
directional arrows are very simple. People don't need to do any active processing to understand how they can reach to their destination with the arrows. But for the relative location updates, people do need to uh, do some mental processing or active processing in order to figure out how they can reach to their destination. So we actually use the frame of references and navigation cues to come up with four different versions of interface design. For the map interface, we came up with two versions where we use the map interface with the directional arrow on the left, and then on the right we have map interface with the location marker. So we hypothesize that map interface with the directional arrow will be the lazy approach, and uh, this will directly tell people how to reach their destinations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, map interface with the location marker, that will be the harder approach where people will have to do some active processing in order to understand how they can reach to their destination. But we believe that given that here people are doing some active processing, and we know that active processing sometimes helps people to um, learn new material. So we, are, uh, hyp we hypothesize that the harder approach will be more useful for people to learn about their environment. <coughs> Similarly, for the video interface, we have two versions, one with the directional arrow and another with the navigation circle. Uh, again, we are uh, hypothesizing that the first one will be the lazy approach and the second one will be the harder approach but more useful for learning. So to test our hypothesis, we designed an user study. So uh, for our user study, we developed an indoor navigation app for one of our academic building. And uh, we created four different versions of the app where we used four interface designs in each uh, version. So in our user study, we recruited eight participants uh, for each uh, interface design. So in total, we had 32 participants. So let me explain um, first how we uh, conducted the user study. First, when a participant came to our study, we assigned, randomly assigned an interface design to them, and then we asked them to complete an assisted navigation task. So the task was very simple. We actually took the participant to a particular location and asked them to go to three different destinations in a particular sequence. When they completed all the destinations, we considered the task is complete. Once the participant completed the task, uh, we asked them to complete two incremental survey knowledge tests. I'll explain the test in, uh, in the next few slides, but uh, first see what is the flow of the study. So after completing this uh, incremental survey knowledge test, we actually asked our participants to complete three more assisted navigation tasks. So uh, all these assisted tasks are very similar. The only difference is every time our participants had to find three new destination points, and for that they had to walk through new corridors of that floor. And all these tasks were done in the same floor of the building. Now, when participants completed all the assisted navigation tasks, we asked them to complete an integrated survey knowledge test based on all the knowledge that they have gathered from uh, the assisted navigation tasks. And finally, uh, we asked them to complete some route knowledge tests, and that was in three rounds. And once they completed all the three unassisted route knowledge tests, uh, we paid our participants and debriefed our, the motivation of the study before they left. Now let's see what are the survey and route knowledge tests that we uh, conducted with our participants. For the incremental survey knowledge test, we actually complete, conducted two tests, the orientation test and the path recall test. In the orientation test, we asked participants to imagine that they are actually standing in the starting location for that task, and we asked them to point out the direction of the three destinations that they encountered during that task. And the, for the path recall test, uh, we asked them to draw the route that they have covered during that task. And we also asked them to point out where they encountered their destination points. So these two tests were uh, designed so that we can measure incrementally how people are learning the survey knowledge. Now, once the, our participants completed all the four uh, assisted tasks, we asked them to draw the floor plan 
of the entire floor. Because at that point, people actually uh, walk through all the corridors in the floor. So we are trying to see whether they have learned the entire floor plan with, through these tasks. And finally, we asked them to do some route knowledge tests. For that, we asked to do two route knowledge tests. The first one is the location recognition, and the second one is the unassisted <coughs> navigation. So what we did here, we chose three different uh, locations from that floor. The first location was very easy to find because of that unique architectural uh, staircase. The second location uh, was little harder because it was a sitting location and on that floor there were two other sitting locations which looked very similar but there were some differences if you look closely. And the third one was the hardest to find because it was one of the darkest corridor in the floor. And at the same time, other than those elevator doors, there was no other distinguishable feature in that location. So what we did for this test is uh, we showed each participant <coughs> one picture at a time. And we first asked them, uh, can you recognize this location or not? So that, that you call the location recognition test. And then we asked them uh, to reach to that destination by themselves without using any navigation app. We are assuming that by that time they have learned how to navigate to those locations. So we asked them to no look, uh, navigate on their own. So let's see how our participants performed in these tasks. First, we analyzed how much time they have taken in order to finish those tasks. And we have observed that participants using the location marker for the map interface actually took longer, significantly longer time than participants using the directional arrow for the map interface. And similarly, for the video interface, we have seen that participants using the navigation circle actually took uh, more time, significantly more time than participants using the directional arrow. So as you can see here, in both cases, people using the uh, active processing queues were actually taking longer time to finish their tasks, which was kind of expected because they had to do some active processing to figure out how they can reach to their destination. But when we observe the uh, time taken for tasks two, three, and four, we, had, we saw that there was no significant difference in terms of the time taken. So you can say here that uh, although uh, initially, it was harder for the participants to process the um, relative location update queues, but eventually uh, they learned how to use them. And when they learned it, uh, they were actually not taking any longer than the directional arrow participants. Now let's see how our participants performed in those survey and route knowledge tests. First, we observe the results for the orientation test. Here, um, the y-axis is actually telling you how much error participants made when they pointed to the direction of the destinations. So this is an error property. So here, um, lower value is actually better than the higher value. So we have seen that for the video interfaces, participants using the video interface with the navigation circle actually perform significantly better than the interface with video interface with the directional arrow. And similarly, for the path recall test also, this is also, again, an error property. We calculated how many times people have made mistake when they actually had to draw the route of their path. So here also, we have seen that uh, participants using the uh, directional, so here, it, this is also an error property. So lower value is better. So here, uh, participants using the location marker and uh, navigation circle actually perform significantly better than participants using the directional arrow of the corresponding interfaces. So overall, these two tests are uh, just telling us that active processing of the navigation information can actually help people learn about their survey knowledge better. And now let's see how people did for the floor plan recall test. So this was the actual floor plan of the floor. And here I have two samples. The first sample was drawn by one of the participants, which was actually very close to the actual floor plan. And the bottom one is drawn by another participant, which was uh, quite off from the uh, original one. Now, we uh, asked two coders to independently rate the uh, drawing uh, with the 
uh, read the, those uh, floor plan drawings, and then uh, they both of them use the same criteria to read the drawings. In the paper, we have explained uh, in elaborately like what was the criteria. For the sake of time, I am not explaining it here. So in the floor plan recall test, on the y-axis, you can see the uh, rating for those drawings. Uh, this is not an error property. So here, higher value is actually better than the lower value. So we have found that participants using the map interface actually perform significantly better here than participants using the video interface. So you can say here that uh, actually the map interface help people to learn about the floor plan better. Um, than participants using the video interface. Uh, basically, video interface participants have never seen the floor plan uh, as a whole, so it was really hard for them to uh, draw the floor plan from their memory. And finally, the route knowledge tests. So here, um, for the location recognition test, we actually gave score to our participants uh, depending on their answer. So when we showed them a picture, First, we ask them whether they recognize that location or not. If they say that they recognize the location with high confidence, then we gave them two points. If they say that they recognize the location but they are not confident <coughs> enough, we gave them one point. And if they say that they don't recognize it at all, we gave them zero point. So on the y-axis, you can see those scores. And here we have seen that participants using the video interfaces actually performed better, significantly better here than participants using the map interfaces. So uh, given that in the, um, in the test when uh, participants were using the video interface, they could see the live feed of the environment. So most of the places were very familiar to them because they were seeing those places through the live video. Uh, whereas on the map interfaces, people were actually concentrating on the map uh, to figure out how they can go to their destination. So probably that was the reason why uh, participants in the video interface performed better in terms of recognizing those locations. And finally, for the unassisted navigation task also, uh, video interface participants actually performed better. So overall, you can say that viewing the video interface was actually helpful for the participants to gather the route knowledge about the environment. So to summarize our findings, we found that interfaces with the directional arrows were always easier for our participants to navigate in an environment. But uh, the harder approach, actually, uh, when people use the location markers or the navigation circle, uh, people found, find, uh, found it little difficult in the beginning to navigate, but over the time they learned it. And when they learned it, they actually performed better in terms of learning the spatial knowledge through those interface designs. And uh, last but not the least, we found that both map and the video interfaces have some advantages in terms of how people learn spatial knowledge. So uh, maybe in future, We'd like to design something where we'll combine both the map and the video interfaces at the same time in an interface design so that we can get the advantage of the both world. So on that note, I would like to conclude my talk, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Good. Thanks. Nice talk. I have a question. I saw that you have a between subjects design. Did you consider the special ability difference between the groups inside each participant? Yeah, actually, we uh, measured the special ability in the beginning. We didn't find any uh, difference, in significant difference between these two groups. Yeah, I didn't explain it okay. in the. Yeah, but yes. I was just curious where um, where voice fits into this because a lot of the time when people are navigating or using their app, they're you know listening to the voice commands. Yes, so we actually thought about it when we designed our apps because that is very natural for the GPS applications as well. We didn't do it because it was an academic building, so at some uh, point people were getting distracted with the uh, noise in the environment. But one interesting thing is when we uh, tried it with our pretest. We found that uh, participants who were very young, like around uh, 20 to 25 average age, they actually preferred the voice more 
than the group of people who were uh, around 60. Uh, so people uh, the older age, uh, they actually said that it was distracting. Uh, to some extent, they were trying to concentrate on the environment more than every time getting distracted by the app. But yeah, that is a good point. But uh, for this test, we just didn't do it because of the environmental limitation. Any other questions? Um, um, at what point did you tell users what the um, incremental knowledge tests would be? Did they know ahead of time or only after they did it the first time? Only after they did it in the, uh, the first task. So we didn't tell them ahead of time. But after they did the first task, they kind of guessed it that it's going to come after the second task as well. So. Uh, if I guess correct, that maybe you're asking whether they were guessing that they will have to do that task from the second task onward. Right. Yes. Right. So I think they actually guessed it. So uh, I can tell you, like, uh, for some participants, they were actually trying to do the path recall test first <laughs> so that they make less error in terms of pointing to the direction. But we made sure, like, to ask them to do in the sequence that we asked them to do. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I was also wondering that as, as you do your second um, sort of um, route, you might already be you Our, know, yeah. expecting to have to recall where you're going. So I think you're walking around this space with a different mindset the second and the third and the fourth time than you did the, the, the first, first time. time. So because I, I noticed that you, you didn't see any changes in like, you know, task cycle two, three, and four, but there were differences in one. Yeah. And that effect may be another you know, thing going on that once people knew what they were supposed to recall afterwards, mm -hmm. they were, their brain was doing something else and, and that might sort of, you know, smoothen out the differences or, or just change people's mental state and may, may confound what you, what you were trying to tease apart between the techniques with, with rounds two, three, and four. So uh, here I want to point that the, there was no difference in terms of the time taken for this second, third, and fourth tasks. But in terms of the performance, we have seen that task one, two, three, four, they, the errors or the performance was not actually different. So they were very similar. In terms of time, people actually took time to learn the system for the first task. And we also, uh, like, uh, I mean, not everyone did the first task as the same task, so we uh, interchange in terms of like participants, what task they are doing in, in the beginning. So that way we are trying to uh, minimize in terms of the order of the tasks. So the only place where we uh, see those first tasks versus the la last three tasks was the time, but not in terms of performance. Thank you. Um, so you haven't talked too much about allocentric versus egocentric spatial cognition, but I think that most of your work basically confirms that uh, the allocentric interface is like the map, is very good for survey, whereas the egocentric interface, like the video yes. representation, is very good for route finding. So I was wondering um, if you also thought about to try to get the best of both worlds in terms of yes. showing an allocentric map, but combine it with a navigation circle to also enhance the egocentric perception. Yes, so we are actually working on that now in terms of uh, joining those cues. And uh, one challenge is like uh, the problem with introducing everything in the same interface is that sometimes it's too much information. So it's not always good to have all the information at the same time. It depends at what uh, order or at what combination you are adding them. So yeah, you're still working on that and to understand like what is the best approach. So that's why uh, in the future work I said that adding the both map and video as well as adding those cues. And we want to see also like how it performs in the end. Yeah, so maybe one last question. Yeah. Thank you. You have uh, talked in the beginning about the differences between indoor and outdoor navigation. Um, looking at the study now, I'm wondering what would you expect to change about the results if you do it in an outdoor setting instead of indoors? Yes, so uh, one main thing uh, we are concerned about in terms of outdoor environment is that uh, in outdoor environment, uh, there is a high risk if you ask people to actively process the navigation applications. So we were a little skeptical in terms of whether we should introduce all these design elements in outdoor places or not. So I would be happy to know how the things perform, but at this point, we have not tried it for the outdoor places. 
Thank you. So um, I think we all have a good spatial understanding of the two rooms uh, which are connected here. So um, I think we have a good routing as well as survey understanding. I think we also know how to transition from this room to this room just by walking there. But before we all go to the coffee break, I would like to ask you all to please um, give a round of applause to all the speakers. Thank you.